The Bible reading for today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17 through 25. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do as well, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Father, uh, we are thankful that you speak. We're thankful that you've given us your word, that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, we come before you this morning as those who are helpless. Uh, in ourselves, Lord, we are ignorant. We need you to open our minds to your word. We need you to give us understanding. We need you to work in our hearts to change us and transform us. That we would bring you honor and glory in all that we do. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would work now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, will you please be seated? And as you do, let me uh, encourage you to keep your bulletins open to that reading from Hebrews chapter 13. Are there Bibles in the pews? You are welcome to use those Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, you're welcome to take one of those Bibles home with you. Church leadership has fallen on hard times these days. It seems that more and more people distrust Christian leaders. Depending on the polls you look at, a, a recent Barna poll seem to reveal that only about 57% of adults in the U.S. agreed, at least somewhat, that a pastor is a trustworthy source. Not exactly a ringing endorsement, but perhaps rightly so. You know, sadly, it's not an unusual occurrence anymore to read of leaders abusing their authority in the church and engaging in scandalous behavior. And the stories would be too numerous to even try to mention. Uh, just over the last couple of weeks even, I've seen stories of pastors and Christian leaders who have been arrested for things like embezzling money, sexual abuse, and even animal cruelty. Such occurrences make it hard even for Christians, much less non-Christians, to trust leaders in the church. Uh, one of you recently drew my attention to a movie that came out last year called Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul which is described as being a mockumentary about a church scandal and how a pastor and his wife built this megachurch with all of the prosperity elements that we've come to know too well. Such is the way, I suppose, the watching world views much of Christian leadership. But you know, it should be no surprise to us that leadership would be a real place of temptation where the devil is very much at work. Because, friends, God intends really good things through the exercise of good leadership. Now, one of my favorite verses on leadership comes from 2 Samuel 23, which makes clear just how good good leadership can truly be. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. In other words, good godly leaders bring light and life and health to God's people. 
Well, we've been studying Hebrews for a long time now. And it seems that this church of Hebrew Christians had perhaps begun to doubt the leadership of their church. And it may be, in fact, that that's part of what initiated this letter. But what we see here this morning is that for them to do so, to throw off the authority of the leaders that God had given them, would be extremely detrimental to their spiritual health. And so that's one of the themes we're going to see here this morning. It's the importance of good leadership in God's church. Now, this is actually the very last sermon uh, in what has been a 10-month series that we've been doing. We're finishing up a year in Hebrews this morning. I always think it's a thing we're celebrating when you've made your way through a long series like this. We, we should celebrate that we've got to the end here today. And as we come to these final verses of this letter, we, we find some of the typical things that you find at the end of a letter. You, you have the kind of final thoughts and encouragements and instructions, as well as your uh, typical end of letter greetings. You know, say hi to so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so says hi to you. Right, these kind of things that remind us that these are, these are real people. Oh, this is a real letter. There are real personal relationships involved in all of this. But one of the things we also have at the end of this letter is a reminder of what this letter is meant to accomplish. Verse 22, if you look at verse 22, it describes what this whole letter has been about. It's a word of exhortation. And of course, the exhortation that we've seen throughout this letter is the exhortation to these Christians to not abandon their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again, the author of this letter has been saying, there's no one more glorious than Jesus. And all of God's plans and purposes for our salvation are all focused on Jesus. All of the Old Testament was about Jesus and is, was building to Jesus. Jesus is the point of it all. So don't leave Jesus. Keep enduring. Keep running this race of the Christian faith. That's been the word of exhortation that's permeated this whole letter. And so as we come to the end of this letter now, the author gives these instructions here to these Christians, and what he's doing is he's giving one final appeal to hear his word of exhortation. And therefore, one way to, to view these closing verses is not simply that they're throwaway lines at the end of a letter, but that actually they're critical reminders of what it is that's needed if this church is truly going to bear with this word of exhortation that's been written. And specifically, the author here is saying to them, He's saying that they're going to need the community of the church, including their leaders, and more importantly, they're going to need the grace of God at work in their lives. So let's think about those two things this morning, the community of the church and the grace of God. And friends, let's pray that we here at Christ Church will be those who truly heed this word of exhortation that Hebrews has given us for the last 10 months. So first... If we're going to truly receive the message of this letter and put it into practice, we're going to need the community of the church. Uh, if you look at verses 23 and 24, uh, they reveal some of the wider connections that this church had. Uh, our brother Timothy, who's mentioned there, he seems to be the, the same Timothy who was a, a critical part of the Apostle Paul's ministry team. Uh, apparently, Timothy was in prison for a bit, but he's now been released. And so both he and the author of this letter, they're, they're hoping to visit this church again soon. Uh, there's also some uh, apparent connection with Christians in Italy. Now, whether that means that this church itself was uh, located in Italy and, and thus greetings are being sent back to them from those Italians who have gone out from them, or, or whether it means that this church was located elsewhere, uh, maybe near Jerusalem, but the, the author was currently in Italy and thus he was sending uh, greetings from, from the Italians there. Well, it's not clear which is which, uh, but what is clear is the richness of the Christian community of which this Hebrew church was a part which is, of course, is always a necessary reminder. It's always a good reminder that we aren't the only Christians out there. You know, we're in this battle for endurance with other brothers and sisters in Christ who are scattered all over the world. But, of course, the main emphasis in this final section is on the relationship between those within this local church and the leaders of that church. The word elders uh, isn't used here, but that seems to be the idea. Uh, that the, the leaders referred to there in verse 17 are the elders of the church. Because the, the leaders mentioned here clearly have some authority in the church, and, and that's how elders are described in the rest of the New Testament. And so three times now, in chapter 13, leaders have been mentioned. 
Uh, as we saw last week back in verse 7, the people in this church were instructed to remember their leaders. That is to remember those leaders who had died, who were no longer with them, and so they were to remember their former leaders. Verse 17 now, though, instructs the church to obey their current leaders. And then verse 24 simply instructs them to greet all their leaders. So let's spend some time thinking about verse 17 in particular, because verse 17 provides the most detailed instruction for how a local church community should engage with the leaders that God has given them. Look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then actually verses 18 and 19 are applicable here as well, because not only is the church to obey its leaders, but it's also to pray for its leaders. And thus the author of Hebrews asks for prayer, verse 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Meaning, listen, I've, I've written to you and I've written some hard things to you, but I've done it out of love. My, my conscience is clear. I, I've sought to be honorable in all things. Pray for us. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. So obey and pray for your leaders. Now, how do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, uh, we do need to think carefully about this call to obedience and submission. Because Hebrews 13, 17 isn't the only place this kind of command is given. Uh, Peter tells the church in 1 Peter 5 to be subject to the elders. Paul speaks in Acts 20 of the elders having oversight in the church. And so we do need to think carefully about this call to submit to the elders of the church who have this responsibility for overseeing the church. In fact, the reason I open today's sermon by mentioning the failings of Christian leaders is because we do need to recognize and be honest about the fact that there is such a thing as spiritual abuse. And there is such a thing as the abuse of pastoral authority that can take place within a local church. You know, to make the distinction that's commonly made, there is a difference between authority and authoritarianism. Now, none of us, especially in the church, should have to be subject to authoritarianism. But all of us should willingly and joyfully place ourselves under God-given authority, including the authority of leaders God gives to his church in the form of the office of elder pastors. Okay, so what's the difference between authoritarianism and true God-given healthy authority in the church? In other words, when verse 17 says, obey your leaders and submit to them, I mean, what exactly are we being instructed to do here? Uh, the author Jonathan Lehman uh, identifies some of the ways that we might distinguish godly authority from authoritarianism. Uh, here, here are some of uh, his observations. Uh, authoritarianism commands the flesh and makes no appeal to the spiritual new man in the gospel. Authoritarianism starts with the imperatives of Scripture, not the indicatives of what Christ has accomplished. Authoritarianism first requires outward conformity rather than repentance of heart, thus creating Pharisees. Authoritarianism often oversteps the boundaries of where the Bible has given it permission to go. I think that's a massive one. Authoritarianism, abuse of authority, always goes beyond what the Bible says. Uh, authoritarianism is impatient and forceful. Authoritarianism relies on its own strength rather than leaning on the spirit by faith. And then in contrast, godly authority is by faith. It relies on God to make change. Godly authority exhorts the heart first and the will second. Godly authority appeals to Christians on the basis of their status in the gospel, not on the strength of their flesh. Godly authority is exceedingly patient and tender, knowing that only God can give growth. 
And therefore, when we talk about obedience and submission to leaders in the church, it's critical we understand that what we're talking about is a willing obedience. A willing obedience. Okay, so this isn't an obedience that's to be forced or coerced. And furthermore, it's not a, it's not a blanket obedience. In other words, you don't have to obey something a church elder said simply because it was said by a church elder. And the reason why is because the authority of an elder isn't an, an, an inherent or absolute authority. It's a, uh, it's a delegated authority. Meaning the, the locus of authority for an elder isn't in himself. It's in the Word of God. And so an elder, you see, only has authority when he's faithfully teaching, proclaiming, and applying the Word of God. When it's clear biblical teaching that's coming from the mouth of an elder, that's when you as a church member are called to obey and submit to your leaders. When it's clear biblical teaching that's coming from the mouth of an elder, that's when you as church members are called to obey and submit to your leaders. Now, verse 17 goes on to give two reasons why church members should submit to their leaders. One reason is because of the specific task that God has given them. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Uh, this language of uh, keeping watch means something like uh, they're, they're constantly awake. Uh, they're tireless in their concern for you. Uh, several commentators have drawn a connection between this language here in Hebrews 13 with that of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 on the night of Jesus' birth who were, uh, if you remember how they're described, they, they were keeping watch over their flock by night. Because that's the idea here. In fact, the Anglican reformer Hugh Latimer made this connection between the leaders of Hebrews 13 and the shepherds of Luke chapter 2, saying of, of those shepherds in Luke 2, now these shepherds, I say, they watch the whole night. They attend upon their vocation. They do according to their calling. They keep their sheep. They run not hither and thither, spending the time in vain and neglecting their office and calling. Here, by these shepherds, all leaders may learn to attend upon their offices and callings. I would wish that clergymen, the curates, parsons, and vicars, the bishops, and all other spiritual persons would learn this lesson by these poor shepherds, which is this, to abide by their flocks and by their sheep, to tarry amongst them, to be careful over them, not to run hither and thither after their own pleasure, but to tarry by their benefices and feed their sheep with the food of God's word and to keep hospitality and so to feed them both soul and body. That's what a genuine pastor elder is called to do. So let me address my fellow elders this morning. Uh, brothers, this is your task. Hey, look carefully at verse 17. This is your task. This is my task. Uh, we are to tirelessly care for the souls of the members of this church. It is an enormous responsibility that is given to a pastor elder. And brothers, we will each have to give an account for our ministry. Do you see that there in verse 17? We will have to give an account to the Lord. We are responsible before the Lord. And you can't ride on my coattails, and I can't ride on your coattails. We will each have to stand before the Lord and give an account. And so church members, you should obey and submit because if the leaders of this church are doing the task that God has given us, then you see what we're doing is we're caring for you. We're loving you. We're, we're praying for you. We're seeking your good. Uh, we're exhorting you and we're teaching you. And at times, yes, we're, we're correcting and, and maybe rebuking you, but we're, we're doing so with the word of God. And it's for your good. You know, our desire is that you would grow. Our desire is that you would thrive as you're fed and you're, you're nourished with the, the food of God's word. We want everything that we've seen in Hebrews here to be true of, of you in your life with Christ, that you would love Jesus, that you would worship him, that you would, go, you would go after Jesus your whole life. And so you see, it is to your advantage that you submit and obey. 
In fact, that's the second reason the author gives here for why church members should willingly submit to the leaders of the church. Let them do this, let the, let the leaders uh, shepherd, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, I think most every true pastor will tell you uh, that being a pastor is filled with uh, wonderful joys. Uh, you get to walk with people through all sorts of situations. You often get a front row seat for people, seeing people grow in the Lord. It's, it's, it's a joy in so many ways. But I think a true pastor would also tell you that uh, it also comes with incredible pain and disappointment. That there are enormous discouragements in the work of pastoral ministry. I mean, think again of, of the Luke 2 shepherd comparison. Uh, if the sheep are regularly wandering off and not heeding instruction or constantly bucking and biting and fighting with each other, you, know, you think it probably makes a shepherd's job rather burdensome and miserable. And the same can be true in the church. And so we're being instructed here to, to do what we can to help church leaders serve with joy instead of with a, a, a groaning sigh of discouragement. And so what might that look like? Let me just quote another pastor here. Uh, Stuart Oliott, he served as a pastor for a long time in the UK. His reflection on this is, quote, uh, it is not hard to bring grief into the heart of a true pastor, but this verse forbids us to do it. We grieve our leaders when we do not respect them, when we never inform them beforehand of our absences, and when we obviously resent as obtrusive their concerned questions. The fact remains, however, that they remain responsible for our pastoral care, whether we grieve them or not. So let us submit to them, and thus help them to do their job with joy. The more we cooperate with them, the better their care will be. Any other attitude is not profitable for you. By the way, this is um, one of the reasons why church membership really does matter. I mean, in one sense, all church membership really is is saying, I'm going to submit to the godly authority of the leaders of this church. I'm going to let them keep watch over my soul. Okay, so, so if, if nothing else, think of church membership as a way of helping the leaders of a church lead well. Because as a leader, I can tell you that it's really hard to shepherd people if they don't make explicit that they want you to shepherd them by becoming a member of the church. And then to add to that this reality that I have to give an account for the souls that I'm called to keep watch over, uh, I, I, so I tremble at that. I take that seriously. And so I want to be very clear about the souls for which I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord for. And so becoming a member of a church is in one sense just a way of helping the leaders love you and care for you and to be able to do so with joy. And of course, if someone's not a member of a church, it's hard to know how they can even obey verse 17. I mean, which leaders exactly must they obey if there are no recognized leaders who are keeping watch over their souls? Now again, the point of all of this is the author saying to this congregation, I want you to heed this letter of exhortation that I've written to you. And in order to do that, you're going to need the church community. You need to know that there are other Christians rooting for you and supporting you. And you're going to need the leaders that God has given you because they are there to tirelessly help you and shepherd you so that you will indeed endure to the end keeping your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So obey them and pray for them because they are there to help you run this race. Now, as important as all that is, what's also needed if we're going to heed this word of exhortation is secondly and even more significantly the grace of God at work in our lives. Notice, in fact, that this is the way this, this letter ends in verse 25. Grace be with all of you. Those are the final words of this whole letter. Grace be with all of you. Also, if you look a few verses earlier, in verses 20 and 21, 
Uh, you have one of the most beautiful benedictions and prayers in the whole Bible. And it's a prayer that God will be graciously and powerfully at work in this church community in order to bring about in their lives the very things this letter has exhorted them to do. Look at verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a great prayer, isn't it? Uh, it's a great, great way that we can be praying for each other. Uh, it's a great way that you can be praying for the leaders of the church. It's a great way that the leaders of the church can be praying for you. Because it makes so clear just how dependent on the Lord we really are and, and just how gracious God has been to us in Christ. I mean, for one, it shows us who God is for us in Jesus Christ. He is the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. And Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. Friend, do you know God as the God of peace? Is that who he is to you? Have you put your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Are you reconciled to God? If so, God is the God of peace to you. He speaks peace to you. He calms your soul. He quiets your fears. And as he does so, it changes you and, and it shapes you. This peace begins to to permeate everything about your life. To know that God is the God of peace to you provides the assurance that all of his plans and purposes for you are good. And the reason they are is because the God of peace has raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, he received Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you. And so when he raised Jesus from the dead, the Jesus who he raised is the great shepherd of the sheep. All other leaders... All pastor elders understand that they're just under shepherds. Jesus is the great shepherd, the one who perfectly and tirelessly watches over your souls. Listen, the elders of this church will fail you. I have failed some of you. But Jesus will never fail you. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. And this Jesus has been raised from the dead. The great shepherd will shepherd your soul into eternity. He has been raised from the dead so that you, too, can be raised from the dead. Your shepherd will shepherd your soul into eternity. Again, what a great way to pray. To address our prayers to the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. So this prayer shows us who God is for us in Christ. Second, it shows us how it is that God blesses us and does us good. It is by the blood of the eternal covenant. It is through Jesus Christ. So the reason God is the God of peace to us who blesses us is because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross by shedding his blood for our sin. Jesus has taken the punishment we deserved, and so God now can pour out his blessings upon us. And the fact that it's the blood of the eternal covenant means that the whole Bible is about Jesus. Uh, the old covenant was merely a, a type of the eternal covenant, pointing us to Jesus, revealing Jesus to us and what his blood and sacrifice would accomplish. And the fact that it's an eternal covenant means that it'll never end. God will always and forever pour his blessings on us because of what Jesus has done for us. And again, what a great way to pray. What a great way to come before God's throne of grace, to do so completely reliant upon and looking to Jesus, knowing that the blessings of God in our life are not dependent on our good works, but on the blood of Jesus that will atone for our sins eternally. And so this prayer shows us who God is for us in Christ. He's the God of peace. It shows us how he blesses us in Christ. It's by the blood of the eternal covenant. And then third, it shows us the way in which God blesses us in Christ. 
which is by equipping us to do his will for his pleasure. Now look again at these verses. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are completely dependent on God. Do you see that here? We're completely dependent on God. Now, it's not that we're passive in our sanctification. Uh, It's not that we're we're passive as we seek to heed this word of exhortation and and to live out the things in this letter. It's just that we're completely dependent on God and His sanctifying grace to us. The author, Jerry Bridges, summarizes this, I think, in a helpful way. He says, progressive sanctification, that is this this progressive, ongoing work of God transforming us into the image of Jesus and, and making us increasingly holy, progressive sanctification is not a partnership with the Spirit in the sense that we each, the believer and the Holy Spirit, do our respective tasks It's not like the Holy Spirit has his checklist of things that he needs to do, and then we have our checklist over here, we have these things to do, and we each kind of do our separate things, and then and they work together. No, that's that's not what it means. Bridges goes on. Rather, we work as he, the Holy Spirit, enables us to work. His work lies behind all our work and makes our work possible. Or to put it in more down-to-earth language. In his confessions, Augustine wrote, My soul is like a house, small for you, O God, to enter, but I pray you to enlarge it. It is in ruins, but I ask you to remake it. It contains much that you will not be pleased to see. This I know and do not hide. But who is to rid it of these things? There is no one but you. And that's the point. You and I need to be equipped by God so that we can do his will. We need him to give us the good things we need in order to do good in this world for his glory. We are completely dependent on him. And in fact, it's not, it's not just being equipped, it's also being enabled. We actually need God, as verse 22 puts it, to work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. We need God to work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Now, friends, for me, this is one of the great mysteries of the Christian life. Uh, All of our working, all of our doing as Christians is actually a result of God working and doing in us. And so this is how we should pray. Uh, We should pray this way for ourselves and for others. Lord, we want to please you. We want to do your will. So through Jesus Christ, equip us, enable us to do just that. This is what I pray for all of you. I pray for each of you by name. I, I work my way through our membership directory, and I pray for you. And this is what I'm praying, that God would equip you to do that which pleases him, that he would enable you to accomplish it. Think of what Jesus says in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. You're a branch. You can't do anything on your own. The branch has to be stuck to the vine. It needs the nutrients. It needs the life of the vine flowing through the branch. Or Ephesians 2, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Or Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He gives you the will to want to do it, and he gives you the ability to actually do it. You see, the whole of the Christian life is lived in the power of another, and that power belongs to God. We live in his power. And so the question then becomes, well, how do we do that? How do we live our lives as those equipped and enabled by God? And the short answer, just a short answer this morning, the short answer is by prayer and faith. Uh, we, We pray in this way. 
we, we pray, we ask God to equip us with what we need, and then we exercise faith. We trust his promises. We trust that he's at work. And then as we do so, we act. We actively seek to carry out his will for his glory. Prayer, faith, action. So friends, as we close out this Hebrew series this morning, again, we're given this one final appeal here in verse 22 to bear with this word of exhortation, that is to, to heed it, to pay attention to it, to put it into action so that our faith in Jesus will not waver but will endure to the end. And if we're going to do so, then we need the community of the church especially the leaders of the church whom God has given to us to keep watch over our souls. And most importantly, we're going to need the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We need God's help. We need to pray to him, to trust him, to act in his power for his glory. It is by grace that we're saved, and it is by grace that we'll endure. And so, friends, now that we are done, after almost 10 months of study, let me ask you, what will you do with the teaching of this letter? Will you respond to the appeal of verse 22? I mean, it really is just a brief letter. It's going to take you less than an hour to go back and read through it again. Will you bear with this word? Will you give it your full attention? It's a letter that speaks so beautifully of the gospel and of what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for us. It's a letter that so powerfully declares the supremacy of Jesus over everything. It's a letter that so urgently calls on us to stay the course, to run the race, to endure to the end. Will you give this your full attention? Will you take its message seriously? What steps will you take to remember its truths and to put its lessons into practice? Will you keep going in your faith? Will you endure? Will you keep loving and worshiping Jesus alone? If so, you're going to need the community of the church and you're going to need the grace of God. And so, brothers and sisters, grace be with all of you. Let me pray for us. Uh, Lord, we are very dependent on you. And so we ask you, Father, we ask that you would please accomplish these things in us. And we thank you for this study that you've given us over the last year. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth, its clarity, and its power. Father, continue to work in us, we pray for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.